All right, everyone. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and it is lovely to be with you here on a Friday for the masterclass today, dealing with video and audio stuff, five fun features in After Effects and Audition. That sounds like a throwaway title. Kind of is. But in truth, these are five fun features, and I was playing around with a bunch of stuff because some of you may have seen if you've been sniffing around the Discord. We've got a new um, by user request After Effects After Effects themed daily creative challenge coming in two weeks. So as a result, I've been trying to find fun, kind of easy, social related, socially created kind of things that'll make sense to do an After Effects for anyone. And I thought I'd kind of drop a couple of these now. So if you're going to take the challenge in a few weeks, um, you'll kind of have an idea of what to do and you can get a jump start on some of the techniques and things we're going to be covering. So as always, we're coming to you live on Behance, Adobe Live, YouTube, and Twitter Periscope. So thank you so much for joining. We've got Uma Korn here, Wade, Steve, Festus Kosabu, Mallory, Ferry, Ryan Selvi. Nice to see you all. Mercurial, how's it going? Cal, great to see you. Demaz and Uvertum Silva, hey there. And uh, we've got quite a few people over on the Periscope as well, because as I've been joking, Periscope, of course, video is going away May March 31st, so uh, get it while it's still hot. Now, uh, if you are going to be following along in the chat for today, I am going to be watching actively the chat over at behance.net slash live, or b b e dot net slash Adobe Live. So go there. That's the chat that's going to be in front of me. I'm going to send a little note to my channel as well. I'm following the chat over at... <laughs> okay, and hey, hey, Des, what's happening? Okay, so um, without further ado, I think we're going to get started. Oh, and by the way, it's worth pointing out that uh, if you've been following my uh, some of the socials, you notice that uh, I have my, my new old look back <laughs> on Wednesday. New year, new day, new prez, old beard. And it was nice because my children said, gee, dad, you look less old. So I've got that going for me. Okay, so with that, uh, what's up, Roshan and Kartik? Let's go ahead and switch over to After Effects and let's get started, shall we? All right. Uh, still, by the way, doing some studio reno uh, stuff around here. You can see constantly changing a bit more of the lights, a bit more of the hue and the glow. <laughs> Always need appropriate hue and glow around myself. That's in my rider, actually. It's part of my contract at Adobe. All right. Ryan, I love that the master class is too strong for Jason's hair to obscure it. Yes, <laughs> I just retweaked that thumbnail as well. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about here, and I was hoping that one of our users, David, uh, David Presenter, is watching, is the ability to add a an audio waveform, an animated audio waveform, or more, well, based on the first one I'll show you here, an audio spectrum analysis of spoken word or music over top of your videos. So you see this a lot. Uh, in fact, yeah, maybe I'll just show you kind of a finished one real quick, and then, and then we'll go back to the beginning here. So something like this. So here's one that I created using, th I just used every op uh, option, all the various attributes, and again, um, even without playing it here, just kind of scrubbing through, as I'm talking, what you're seeing is it's translating that into an audio waveform. So let me go ahead and play this back for you and you can kind of get an idea of what this looks and sounds like. In addition to the keynotes, we'll have over 350 breakout sessions, labs, and workshops across 10 creative tracks. And as always, community is a huge part of Max. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. It doesn't necessarily have to look like that, but that's the effect we're going for. And what's super cool is that there's actually two native effects inside of After Effects that will allow you to do that sort of audio waveform spectrum animation based on audio. You could do it on dialogue, you can do it against music. Super easy to do, super easy to use, really intuitive. A couple of little tips I'm going to show you here to make the results look better based on specific audio frequency settings. But outside of that, it's fun and it's great for social videos. And as I was talking to my colleague Gus, whom uh, many of you know if you're watching Adobe Live, and he was actually pointing out that it's it sort of kind of falls into the accessibility um, category as well, even though 
technically, it's not like you can really read the waveform, but it does give an indication that there's spoken word or dialogue, you know, in the event that maybe things aren't properly subtitled or whatnot. In any case, it's super easy to use. I'm going to show you how to do it here. So this is a little outtake video uh, from one of the Max commercials that I shot back in uh, September. So I've got that in the timeline here. By the way, it's just worth pointing out in case you're wondering why it was taking a second to play back in silence there. Um, whenever I'm doing stuff with audio, uh, I always choose cache before playback because I, I kind of hate hearing it stop and slow down or sometimes you'll hear it. Hi, I'm Drew. Like as it's caching frames, you'll hear the sample rate change, right? Like if, as you're watching it play. That drives me crazy. So I have it cache before playback when there's audio involved. You don't have to do that. That's just an option that I've enabled here in the preview monitor. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is you need to add a solid layer. So I've got my video on the first layer here, okay? Let's go up to the layer menu and we're simply going to choose new solid, all right? And uh, we'll give it a perfect name, magenta solid three. All right, it's the correct aspect ratio. Everything else is fine. We're not changing anything. It's already going to be the comp size here. Uh, you can assign the color. I'm just going to leave it at that uh, magenta e color like that. And we're done. No. Okay. <laughs> so that's the first step because it's actually the magenta, that solid layer, that's going to drive the visual of the effect that we're adding. So let's go up to uh, effects and presets here. And the first one I'm going to show you is called audio spectrum. Now, as I mentioned, there's two. There's audio waveform and audio spectrum. I happen to like the look of the audio spectrum one. Um, they're a little different, the two of them, but th this one I think just looks a little bit better. So I'm gonna take this effect and I'm gonna drop it onto the solid, not the movie, not the video, not where the audio lives, onto the solid that we added. That's key, all right? So go ahead and do that. All right, and right away, first thing you're gonna see is this kind of centered dotted line, okay? Now, as you might expect, that represents the waveform that you just saw. Okay, so let's hop over to the effects controls here and take a look at some of the parameters. Okay, so the first thing is here, audio layer. So as you might guess, this is going to determine what is, what's going to drive the animation here, all right? So by default, it's choosing that solid layer. We don't want that. The audio is actually coming from this one here, from this QuickTime movie. So we we'll go ahead and choose that. You don't have to change source, okay? You can see you can also choose masks, effects, and masks. So it's just going to be the entire source here, all right? And then we have our start and end point. Now, you might want this to occur in the center. A lot of times where you see this, I've been noticing this a lot lately, like in um, Twitter videos and when I see some podcasts, sometimes on Twitter or uh, on YouTube that don't have the video component, they'll often have the sort of centered waveform. Naturally, you can, you can place this anywhere you want. So if you go ahead and choose one of your, um, I don't even know, what do we call these? Locators? I don't know. Uh, I'm going to choose this one here. And let's kind of do this in the sort of lower third section down at the bottom. Now, again, if you've got subtitles, or captions, maybe you don't want it in the lower third because that's typically where your captions are gonna go. Maybe the captions go above, maybe they go, they're offset somewhere else. So again, totally flexible in terms of where this is going. And for this one, I'm just going to put in the same vertical coordinates here. And that should snap evenly down there. Okay, perfect, all right. Now, without doing anything, let's see Let's see what this looks like, okay? Uh, and I'm doing this to make a point because, again, you might think, oh, well, this sucks. It's not working or it's not doing enough. So we're going to kind of go through the parameters to see what's happening. In the meantime, uh, let me go ahead and check the chats, all right? All right. Richard, oh, I see ex some excitement around this feature. Very nice. All right. In addition to the keynotes, we'll have over 350 breakout sessions, labs, and workshops across 10 creative tracks. Okay, so right away you're noticing like, there's just not a lot of movement going on here, <laughs> right? It's very, it's very minimal, okay? And that's fine, that's, that's by design here because you've got a whole bunch of settings. In fact, the first four are really the crucial ones, okay? Those are the ones we're gonna pay the most attention to right now. So. First, let's tackle the visibility. So the first thing you want to do is adjust the maximum height. 
So what I like to do is to like sort of find a section here where I can see anything at all, right? So this this particular phrase right here, I'm seeing some inkling of some frequencies. Come over to max height. I'm going to hold down my shift key, which is going to allow me to move in larger increments as I scrub this hot text. And now you can see I've got the ability to adjust that height, all right? Now again, based on the height that you're setting, you may want to readjust the relative positioning here. I'm kind of right at the edge of the video frame. That's okay. Uh, again, you can you can move it if you want. You can make these as, as tall or short as you like. But now, just by making that adjustment, so we're at around 5,400 um, as I scrub through it, it automatically now, there's just, there's just more visual happening, right? Okay. But there's another element to this. Um, it's also kind of kind of thin, right? Now, if there's anything wrong with thin, but maybe again, it's just not quite as dramatic looking as you'd like. So you may have noticed there's another setting here called thickness, which for 2021, we should replace that K with a C. <laughs> My teenager right now is going, oh, dad. Oh, no, please don't, don't. I like thick. What's, why not? All right, thickness, okay? Now, you'll notice it gets kind of soft and strange looking if you go too much. I usually like to add just enough so that it's just those lines, you know, that you wouldn't get, think of it this way. When it's too thin, you're looking at like a, a, a moray disaster, <laughs> potentially. Um, so I like to make it just kind of thick enough so that you can see it. Now, as I'm doing that, you might think, well, that's cool. And actually, yes, this does look like um, there's a there's a podcaster I follow who does audio podcasts, and he always makes his Twitter posts with this animation in this exact style, probably done here in After Effects. The problem is I don't like this kind of display. And this particular effect refers to this as a digital waveform display. Let's go ahead and go to the twirl down menu here. And notice it has analog lines and analog dots. So if we go to analog lines, let's take a look at this one here. This one now, <laughs> again, in its own way, kind of represents a little bit more of what kind of a standard waveform display would look like. And you've probably seen some of these too. Again, it's, it's entirely up to however you want to do it, whatever you think looks best, okay? Let's give it another shot here. In addition to the keynotes, we'll have over 350 breakout sessions, labs, and workshops. Okay. Pretty cool, right? Looking good. All right, couple more parameters on this. So this one is highly dependent on kind of, again, having enough of the visual in place. Now, the start frequency at 20 hertz, it's interesting that it doesn't actually tell, I mean, it doesn't say it, and it's funny. Um, so your starting frequency is at 20 hertz. That's because 20 hertz is typically the lowest frequency or lowest response frequency that you'll find in like microphone pickups. Speakers are typically rated 20 hertz to 20K. Interestingly, this is going off of, um, you can see for the max frequency here, 22050. So it's using kind of the 441, the 44,100 hertz CD standard. Um, curious that it doesn't go higher than that. In reality, mm, there's not enough really happening much above 20. Well, I mean, that, we can argue that another time. For the most part, there's not enough frequency happening generally that's going to make an impact above 22K. So I can see why it doesn't go beyond that. It's just interesting that they chose 44.1 as the sort of standard here. So this is based off of the Nyquist limit. If we were using 48K, that would be a 24,000 hertz maximum. <clears throat> a little nerd knowledge there for you. Point is, there's nothing happening at 20 hertz on a voice. Nothing, okay? I don't care if you're me or Barry White. Nothing happening at 20 hertz. Challenge me. There isn't. This is just a typical starting reference. So to get the most bang for your buck, or I hate phrases, to get the most value out of this effect, I usually like to bump this up to around 100, 140, 150. And you can see it sort of shifts a little bit. There's just not enough happening much below that. Now you could start it at 60, but 100 hertz is pretty much a solid range where almost all voices are gonna have some kind of resonance here. So what you're trying to do is sort of minimize the frequencies where most of the audio energy is happening to get the most out of this waveform display. That's kind of the key. So you've got your end, you have your uh, start frequency here, then you've got your end frequency. So 2K, 2000 Hertz, that's pretty legit. Um, 
you might even, if you're not kind of seeing enough animation or enough variation in the heights of your waveforms, maybe if you try something like 1500, and you can see it, it's dynamically changing, and it just, it's putting more action across the display more of the time. All right. Again, you got to play with it. It's going to depend on your voice, how it is recorded, what is recorded with. You know, let's see. If I take this now, I mean, you're not going to see a, too much of a significant difference really between 1500 and 2000. A little bit, though. I mean, look at the difference now. So you're just not seeing as many as many of those high peaks. If we go to something like 4000, now we're seeing less. And the reason for that is the momentary resonance of those frequencies, there's just not enough on the high end. So the right side of the spectrum there, it's just wasted. And if you go up to 20K, right, now all of the energy is really confined to the left side, and it's just not enough. So if you're thinking, because initially when I, I remember when I first used this effect, I was like, oh, being the audio man that I am, I, know, I want full, I got very nerdy and like, you know, had an attitude about it, set the frequencies, and I was convinced that this sucks because it doesn't work. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, duh. There's not enough to display there because it's, it's, it's basically plotting it out linearly. So the key is minimize the frequency range, have more detail, more data, more animated visual, on screen. Now for music, this is different, right? Naturally, there are more frequencies present all the time. So you could probably extend, you probably want to extend that range because you might just have too much, too much high level pulsation of, of waveform. It's, it may not look as good. All right. Now you know what to do. And I would say for music, 100 to maybe 5000 hertz. You probably don't need more than that. All right. Maybe even 10K if there's like tons of cymbal and hi-hat and, you know, again, if you've got like some nice cymbal bell and you kind of want that reflecting <laughs> visually, go a little higher. But that's what those are doing. All right. Now you've got audio duration, 90 milliseconds. That's how long that's staying on screen. Audio offset. Again, that's more about sync. So if you're finding that it's a little too fat, like it's too soon or too behind or you're trying to delay it somehow, you can go negative or positive here on the offset, all right? So that does exactly what you'd expect. Softness, same thing here. Uh, if I drop that all the way down, if I kind of zoom in, you can see, I mean, it's looking pixelated because I'm zoomed in here, but the lines are clearly sharper versus, you know, if I go up to 100%, again, even zoomed in, you can just see there's almost like this feathered, feathered mask around it. Let's go to around 40% softness, okay? got inside and outside color. All right. So you can modify those to whatever colors you like here. So if I didn't like that, uh, that magenta, all right, and you can see you've got the outside color here. So it's kind of like your stroke and your fill, all right? Ooh, that doesn't look good at all. All right. Something like that. Then you've got this hue interpolation wheel, which that's going to allow you to do <laughs> what you saw that I had before, which is kind of the the, ra the, the gradient rainbow effect, all right? So if I was trying to kind of do something to match the hues of the room, something like that, meh, I mean, maybe that's not your style. Maybe I want to thin that out. Maybe that's looking a little cheesy now. Maybe I want the outside and inside color to be the same so I don't have that stroke uh, differentiation, okay? So now it's a much smoother gradient, right? Actually, that looks way better. So I just made the inside and outside colors the same. By the way, you can see that you can also choose. It's funny that it says side options, side A, side B. It's channel, channel one, channel two, ch left channel, right channel. So you can choose. You're going to get better results most of the time unless you do, if you do side A and B, unless you're using this with like, like a, you know, six early 60s stereo recording, like early Beatles, you know, where it's all vocals on the left and all music on the right. If you put put this on the right channel, you know, you'd like see Ringo, it can be kind of cool. You can you can change things up and mix it around. Anyway, you get the idea. You've also got um, duration averaging here. This is going to give you. You've seen this a lot too, where basically everything that's displayed um, is kind of averaged in the center. 
So you're not getting a linear uh, 100 to 1500 range. That 100 to 1500 is kind of all comprised into the center and peters out. So the middle would be the highest amplitude, the sides would be the lowest amplitude. That's sometimes kind of cool too. Again, it gives you a different sort of effect, a different flavor of this. Um, I typically don't do that, all right? Anyway, real simple, really easy to use, kind of fun. And uh, here, let's just do the final one here and take a look. All right. So the, yeah, these are the lines. There's also dots. So I've seen this one too on some like uh, Spotify things, all right? Dots are kind of cool. That again, that's kind of like that looks like, you know, it's it's a it's just a neat graphical interpretation. It's not quite as vis visually appealing to my personal choice, my eyes. But, you know, to each their own. Go back to the digital one here. Now that actually looks kind of cool. Again, kind of matching the colors of the studio. I think it looks pretty neat. That beat was cool. Thank you, Sivo. <laughs> All right, Christine Sabello, I just clued into what he's doing. Very nice. Uh, Richard, I find that I can type in higher numbers than what is in the scale. Oh, is that true? Oh, well, maybe you can. Does it let you go higher than that? Maybe maybe that's, uh, here, let's see, end frequency. Can we go higher than 22,000? No, it lets you type it in, but it's still, I don't know if that's what you were talking about, but it's still, it still maxes at, at, at uh, 22,050. Okay, all right. So that is the audio spectrum uh, waveform display. Now, as mentioned, over in effects and presets, we're not going to go over this one now for time, but you see there's another one in here, audio waveform, and it does the same basic thing. It looks a little bit different. It's got almost all the same controls. It just displays a little bit differently. I don't think that one is, is as visually appealing or cool or, uh, yeah, I just didn't like that one as much. So I'm using audio spectrum. That's the name of this effect. And remember the key is add a solid layer, drop the effect onto the solid layer, tell it where the audio is that you're trying to animate. And the rest is just tweaking the settings. All right. Very cool. Nice. All right. Check in the chats here real quickly. Da -da -da -da. All right. All right. Thank you, Wade and Steve and Reverb Mike are answering tons of the cues in the chat for me. So I have very little work to do. What's up, Papado, Barry Moon, Michael, One Eddie, Barba, Boost Moose. Nice to see you. Okay. All right. So the next thing we're going to talk about um, is creating motion graphics templates, Mogerts with protected regions, also known as responsive time-based motion graphics templates. What does that mean? So typically, if you're making a motion graphics template, let's use something like a lower third, or in this case, what we're going to be designing, a logo bug. You, you might have the logo, say, fade on screen at the beginning of your episode, right? Just play music. Hi, I'm Jason Levine. And you want that fade on to always be the same duration. And then the logo just lingers, right? And then when the show is over, it fades out over two seconds or whatever the duration is, or maybe it flies off screen. Whether you create the Mogert in Premiere or After Effects, you have the ability to basically, using markers, set markers at the beginning and the end of your Mogert and say, hey, protect any animations that happen during this time, during this period of time. So that when you're in Premiere and you know you, any Mogert can be stretched to any length, if it has those protected regions, the animations that happen in those protected sections will never change. It will always be the same duration. And anything else that happens in the middle, <laughs> see me stifling burps there? Anything that happens in the middle um, is just squeezed or stretched accordingly. But the beginning and end sections of animation will always maintain the same duration. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. Oh, and we're gonna use the essential graphics panel here to drag in parameters and stuff. All right, so here is my um, Just Play Music logo that a good friend of mine named Wink uh, designed for me a couple of years ago. 
she did it in, in uh, Illustrator. And you can see that I've got the Illustrator file um, directly, the Illustrator layer directly inside of After Effects. Now, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I did a masterclass on using Illustrator stuff and capture um, capture objects in After Effects. And what I was doing here was converting those into shape layers, all in an effort to be able to change, um, you know, change the color, change the fill, change the stroke, redraw or edit the actual vertices of that vector art create shapes and vector layer. I don't need to do that here. The logo is good as it is. The only thing I need to do is to enable one single button. So again, just to show you real quickly. So when you bring after um, Illustrator layers into After Effects, you know, first thing I typically do is scale them, right? So if you scale this up without doing anything, it looks, it looks pretty lousy, right? It's pretty pixelated here. I'll go even larger so you can hopefully see that over the stream. Just pixelated, not good. Right, you can see that the edges are soft, but it's vector, it shouldn't look like that. Ah, that's because you need to enable this button here, right, for vector layer continuously rasterize. So again, when you turn it into a shape layer, that that process is automatically happening. So you can scale and do anything infinitely, it'll always be sharp and perfect. If we're just working off of the illustrator layer here, I simply need to touch this button, enable it, and everything sharpens up beautifully. All right. So just real quickly, if you had didn't see it. So there's the before, right? Continuously rasterize enabled, and there's the after. Right? And now this can be scaled to any size and it's just gonna look awesome, okay? So the first thing I need to do is I'm gonna scale this probably down a little bit. And then I'm just going to move this over into the action safe area. Or is that the title safe area? Title safe, action safe, action safe. Um, I'm gonna move it into the bottom right hand corner. <laughs> All right, and that's where that's going to live. Now I've got another little thing that I might wanna add to this. I'm gonna leave this super clean for the moment. And I'm gonna come over here and I just wanna add a little bit of animation. Oh, well first, let's go ahead and do this. I want this to fade on. So nothing specific, nothing fancy. I'm gonna hit T to go into opacity. I'm gonna set a keyframe. All right. It drops a keyframe right there, wind back to the beginning and go down to zero. So that this fades on over one second. Okay. Again, not fancy, nothing spectacular. It's just what it does. Okay. And then at the end, I'm going to do the same thing. So right around here, set a keyframe. And then just before the end of it, let's have it go back down. So again, it fades out over a second, it fades in over a second. So I always want that section always to maintain that fade duration always. So here's how we do that. Okay, first thing you need to do is make sure that you don't have any layer selected. Okay, because we're going to place a timeline marker as opposed to a layer marker, right? Just like in Premiere, you can put markers on the clips or in the timeline in the sequence, we want it in the in the comp here. So um, if we go up to the layer menu here, you can choose add marker or on the Mac, it's uh, control eight. You know, I am uh, very highly challenged when it comes to markers. All right. So now we have our marker in the timeline. I'm going to hold down my option key. And when I do that, you'll see that it changes the cursor here into this right facing arrow, which allows me to extend the duration. So I'm making this a range marker or a region marker. I think we refer to it as both in di among different apps. Okay. So now we have a marker range again. Now any animation that would happen in this duration will be preserved, but we're not done yet because we need to now right click control click on this. Now we can do this in two steps or do it all at once. We can simply enable the protected region, but let's go into settings because this is going to give us a little bit more, a little bit more to work with. Okay. So here we are. All right. So again, it shows us the duration so we can make quick adjustments here. We can put a comment if we want, uh, probably not necessary. Now I do like to label them. So let's put it in fuchsia because why not? And then you'll see if you've built Mogerts in Premiere, we have that responsive design time 
checkbox that you can enable when you're in Essential Graphics? Well, here it is right here. And in After Effects, that's referred to as creating a protected region. So go ahead and click on that, click OK, and now you're going to see that that marker section has turned fuchsia, all right? And now this is a protected region. So any animation that we do here, whether it's the opacity, we could add some other effects, whatever. I'm not going to get fancy for now because that's just not me. <laughs> we'll stay protected, okay? Now we're going to do the same thing over here. So let's come over to this keyframe, maybe just before it. All right, make sure nothing is selected. I'm going to control eight again, zoom in, hold down my option key, drag the marker to the end. All right. Same thing, fuchsia, protected, okay, out, there we go, all right? So now this is also a protected region, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that I can't add other effects. And again, maybe there's some elements of this that I want, that I want to be able to change in terms of the logo bug itself. So for something really simple, again, I've shown you how to do this if you watch some of the streams recently. Um, manually with expressions. In fact, I think I covered this in the After Effects one a few weeks ago. We also have a couple of wiggle-based effects. So the wiggle expression is the easiest one in the world. Um, we also have just a couple of cool wiggle effects that do just, you know, they're, they're um, variations on a theme, right? So you can do like sort of gelatin wiggle, position, rotation, scale, shear, and then wiggle rama, which I think gives you all of those various things. That's way too much for a logo. So let's just go ahead and do wiggle position and I'll drop that right onto the layer, okay? Now, again, if I just play this as it is right now, or scrub through it, you can kind of see what the default, I'll zoom in so you can see the animation there. That's kind of what it's just doing by default. And it's still kind of staying very nicely in the range. Not bad, pretty cool. Maybe that's gonna work for some shows, maybe it won't for, work for everything. That's fine, okay? Because I have the ability inside Essential Graphics to actually add in specific parameters that I want the person using this motion graphics template to be able to modify or edit. So first, up in Essential Graphics here, first of all, make sure that we're on the right comp and we are, all right? So if I went to the finished one that I've already done here, all right, this already has some parameters. It's also got a different thumbnail here. Let's go back to this one, logo mode at start. Let's set a poster frame, and it just takes, again, not, not a great poster frame because it's just white on black there and it's very small. We could change that if we so desired. Let's give it a title, JPM logo only. All right, now this is the key, this is the key one here. We're gonna click on solo supported properties. And then what that does is down in the comp uh, timeline here, it now shows us all the various parameters that we can add into the Essential Graphics panel, which can then be editable parameters for someone using this in Premiere. So let's say I want them to be able to modify the wiggle speed and wiggle amount. These are both supported properties. All right, so the first thing is I'm gonna add a comment. These parameters affect speed and amount of wiggle. All right, I'm gonna take wiggle speed, drag it in there. All right, and then maybe I'll just say speed, wigs, wigs per second. <laughs> Wiggles. All right, and amount pixels, okay? And this is something which we're going to get to in a moment, which I'll show you once we bring this into Premiere, you'll be able to change on the fly. Now, this is not keyframed, which means that when I change that parameter, it's happening all the time. That is not affected by what's been protected in those fuchsia sections, okay? We're just creating the Mogra to have some editable parameters to it. All right, now again, if we had converted this into a shape layer, we'd have the ability to do things like change the color of the of the logo on the fly and stuff like that. I don't want anybody touching the color. I don't want anybody touching various elements of the logo itself, just the wiggle. So I can determine as the author here, what's edited. And because this is for me, I wanna keep it simple, all right? So we've got uh, <clears throat> our wiggle speed, our wiggle amount here. 
Now, what else? I'm trying to think. What else did I use in the previous one? There were some other parameters here. Oh, I had I had something else in there. I, you know, I had a brush stroke and some other things. Okay, that's fine for now. Um, I'm trying to think. Is there anything else? Maybe, maybe a scale option. All right, just because. Well, that's actually the wrong scale. I don't want that. Okay, hold on. Let's undo that. I want this scale. Yeah, this scale. Okay. So this is global scale. Now again, I don't have a position option in there yet. I could, I could put position in there. So that way, if I scale it, I might need to move it to readjust it. Why not? It's a supported parameter. Okay. So once I do that, this is going to ask me to save this project. So I'm going to save as mod. All right. Export motion graphics template. Where do I want this to go? Now I can save this locally, or I can save it directly to one of my own libraries or to a shared library. I'm going to stick this in Jason's CC library. I can add keywords here, logo, animated, JPM, just play music. This is only necessary if you're trying to search for certain Mogerts in Essential Graphics in Premiere, but this way, you know, these are the kind of things I use, logo bug. All right. Everything else looks good. It's going in that library. Click OK. That's fine. All right. Anthony, would be cool if color markers were available on Audition. Agreed. Hit me up on Twitter. I, I just did three days of polling. In fact, I think the last poll just ended about how people use Audition or don't, what they use in, in lieu of. Um, that might, I believe that's already been a, a feature request, but... Uh, um, that's a good one for sure. Fade in, fade out, Mr. Miyagi. Very nice reverb mic. All right. Nice. Okay. Cool. Okay. So now that we have that, let's just go ahead and briefly launch Premiere Pro. You might ask, well, why don't I show this in After Effects? Well, you can't, you're creating motion graphics templates to be used in Premiere. If I wanted to use a Mogurt in After Effects, I, I would ha I'd have to open the Mogurt as a project. And I showed that a couple weeks ago as well. So that's a slightly different, uh, slightly different request there. Okay. So here we are opening up um, our Premiere project. Okay, this is my little Galaxian thing here. And let's go to Essential Graphics, where up at the top, it's my most common library, Jason's library. And look what's there. JPM logo only. There it is. So let's go ahead and drag this in and stick it on the edge here. All right, it's going to load it in. Give it a second to do that. When you adjusted the scale, would you center anchor point and object before you add transformations? Yeah, Richard, again, the way I did that was a little backwards because I didn't I didn't anchor it at all. So in this case, that's why I put in that separate position and scale because you're going to scale it. It's going to move out of position. So yes, you can, and you can set those things accordingly. You know, you can also use expressions to drive that as well. Lots of different ways to do that. I, I did it very rough and raw, but yes, you could absolutely do that. Okay. So now it's in here. All right. And you'll see that as it, it fades on over one second, got my little wiggle down there. Okay, and then it fades out over one second. Now, I could make this 30 seconds long. It's still gonna fade on over one second, do its whole wiggle thing, and then fade off over one second. Hence, the protected region. Now, the other element here, if I go to edit this, here we are in Essential Graphics. Notice, here's my comment. These parameters affect speed and amount of wiggle. So, I can adjust the speed, let's say we want like crazy frantic wiggling, this is going to look very erratic. Okay. And we can do more of an amount as well. More wiggle. It's wiggling entirely off screen. Probably not the best choice 
for a logo bug, unless it's chase that logo, unless that's the game we're playing, but you get the idea, okay? So now the wiggle, which runs regardless of duration, you know, this is a very kind of very staticky looking, barely moving now. See, just very slightly. Give it some more. Okay, so now we're doing 15 wiggles per second, but in a very small amount of only two pixels. So note, again, pixels is what this value is. So that's why you can have 500 pixels. And this is kind of showing you in height what that would be. In this case, in a, uh, in a, in a, I think this is a 4K timeline. So yeah, that makes sense. That looks like it's about, about an eighth of that, give or take. All right. And then we have, again, our scale. So we can scale that up. And because the Mogurt has that continuously rasterize enable, notice that as I scale it up here, it's maintaining its beautiful edges. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Whoops. Oh, I just totally moved that off screen. There we go. Very sensitive control here. All right. Maybe scale it down just a little. So maybe I want this to be uh, in the center. There's my there's my channel channel trailer intro. <laughs> okay, really simple, really easy. By the way, case in point, using the Mogur, the, using the protected regions that we just made in After Effects. Let's say I wanted to use this over top of um, this guy right here. I can take the comp and nest it inside of this one, okay? Like this, right? So here's our, here's our logo, again, with the protected regions. But again, I want this to be the entire duration of this video. So notice, because of those protected regions, they never change. Right? So it still fades on over one second, does its thing, does its wiggle, and then you get to the end and it fades off over one second. Okay? Super cool, right? So even if you're creating animations and After Effects, forget, I love using the Essential Graphics panel to have like, again, we didn't even get to master properties today. There's a lot of things you can do in here where you have quick access to parameters without having to especially in the case of a, of a nested comp, you know, twirl down and go, go to all the various parameters and things. You can have them in Essential Graphics so that they're easily accessible um, without, without it being a Mogurt. This can just be a comp, right? We're just using Essential Graphics in this case to really get quick access to things while in After Effects. So it really serves two purposes. I love, since the advent of this panel, um, I, I tend to drag parameters that I change in there when I'm not making Mogurts just because I don't have to twirl stuff down or even worse, you know, my nightmare is like twirling down all these various things and just having, you know, ends of, right? I mean, you've done this, people have, I just don't like scrolling in here. Maybe if I had a bigger monitor or a monitor that was just the comp, the timeline, and then just the playout monitor, maybe, but. I don't like scrolling. So this makes it a lot easier, okay? Yes, there are shortcuts to also reveal edited parameters too, but this is quick access for me. Okay, two things. All right, check, checking here. Nice. Christine Sabello, Mogurt, M-O-G-R-T, <laughs> stands for Motion Graphics Template. And that's what we just created in After Effects as a lower third logo bug to be used uh, to video, on video for video. You know what I mean. All right. I see Tim is asking what happened to your beard. I don't know, Tim, it, it, it fell off. I said at the beginning, it, uh, I shaved it on inauguration day. All right. Nice. Jason, can we do session, do a session with Mogurt specifically for auto reframing in Rush? Oh, sure, Anissa. Yeah. Now in that case, um, and that's a, that's a great question and hello and happy new year. Um, Mogurts for Rush at present 
Rush only supports Premiere created Mogerts. So the, the bummer there currently is that you can't do like this cool audio thing that I made here. Couldn't turn that into a Mogurt to be used in Rush at the moment because After Effects Mogurts are not yet supported in Rush. However, when you're talking about, um, and when you're saying auto reframing in Rush, I assume you want uh, responsive templates, responsive Mogurts that'll work on a widescreen video in Rush, and then you go, okay, make me a nine by 16 and they should auto, auto automatically reflow, reformat themselves. Yes, and those can be created in Premiere. Now I've actually, there's already been a masterclass on this. I, it, I didn't target it for Rush, but talked about that, but that's a great one. I will absolutely add that to the topic list. So that's perfect. So yeah, great. And it, and it works the same way, all right? And I don't wanna to divert too much because I only got about 10 more minutes, but if I were to, um, here, let me just, I'll just do it real fast. All right, if I were to make something, why does it always choose this font that I just, it's just not a font that I want or like, or I just, I don't understand. I've, uh, I'm, just, I'm just talking to myself. Give me Coolvetica or something. What, what is that? I don't like Minion. I like Minions. <laughs> okay. So again, position responsive design. So this is what I would use if I were making something that I want to uh, be responsive regard, um, regardless of aspect ratio. So I could take something like this text. And again, let's say, and I'll put on... Uh, just put on my guides real quick. Um, what am I looking for? Do I have any? Oh, I don't have any guides in here at the moment. Really? Oh. I thought I had more. Okay. Um, I got to reinstall them. So let's say I always want it to be, you can see it's how I'm snapping to that position. I always want it to be there. So what I do in Premiere, if I'm authoring this for Rush, is I, I take this layer, right? And I'm gonna pin it to the video frame. And where do I want it to go? You're gonna use this. I want it to go here. So I always want it to maintain that relative lower right-hand corner position in this approximate space. Now, of course, when you're going to vertical, your lower third dimension is it's it's higher. So it's not physically necessarily gonna be, it won't be that low towards the bottom. That's more what you would see in a widescreen aspect. So it'll adjust accordingly. It's not, it's not exact, exact, but it will be in the lower right. It won't be cut off. There will be padding on the on the on the edge after the G and below the text. So that's what you want to do. All right, and then there's ways if you're trying to make responsive editable text where let's say the text grows. If I were to do that, then you can pin the text to something, like if you were going to do a bounding box that grows over time, you can pin the text to the box or this was added a while ago. We actually have an automatically responsive growing background bounding box here. So by turning that on uh, and let's give it a color all right. Opacity here. Okay, so if I were to edit this text, here is something. Notice the box. Why did I make it so dark? I, it's, I'm not a designer. I'm such a fool. All right, there you go. <laughs> now there's too much opacity, okay? My point is that as you type, it grows or shrinks. So you don't even have to, there used to be this like two-step process of you pin the box to the text and the text to the screen. You don't have to do that anymore. Pin the text to the screen, add the box, and it does it all by itself, all right? Cool, okay. We got six minutes. Your boy's got to hustle. Now, this is kind of a, a it's a it's an it's an easy one to showcase here, but it's one that I think is people forget about. 
So like here, we're doing this audio spectrum analysis, right? And if you find that even after you've tweaked the frequencies, like you're still not getting enough amplitude out of this, well, it could be that you need to increase the amplitude of your audio file. Or maybe you want to clean up the audio file. Maybe there's something you want to do. You want to affect it. You want to add, I don't care. Do what you want. You have a direct path from After Effects to Audition to do that using Edit Original or Edit in Audition, just like in Premiere. So we're going to go ahead and select our uh, movie layer here. Now, again, I could just do Command E. I believe it's the same, uh, it's the same uh, keyboard shortcut. Edit original, and if you have Wave associated with Audition, it'll go there. Or just to be safe, edit in Adobe Audition. So when I do that, it brings in the video, which is nice. Again, so this was added quite a few years ago where you always see the video reference with the audio. We're in the waveform view here. And of course, now it's showing me, even though we took only a seven second section, it's showing me the full clip inside of Audition. So, you know, this was the on camera mic, all right? That's why the sound is not particularly spectacular here. Looks like I do a little. All right. But you know, there's obviously like a lot of noise, right here. So again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time making this sound good necessarily. But just to kind of show you doing an active change. If I were to denoise this, let's just I'm just going I don't even have headphones on. So I'm not listening. Let it do its thing. Okay. I mean, right away, you just notice. So here was before, see, thick, noisy, and there's after, not so noisy, all right? Hello, everyone. Jason Levine here from Adobe. Now, let's also say that I wanted to uh, give the whole thing a little bit, of, little bit of reverb. It's already got some on there because it's the camera mic, but let's say I wanted to do this. Hello, everyone. Jason Levine here from Adobe. Adobe Max, our annual creativity. All right, like that. Hello, everyone. Jason Levine here from Adobe. Okay. Again, not maybe the most ideal. Probably if I were going to send it back for something like that effect, I would focus more on compressing it and then normalizing it, right? And kind of ensuring that there aren't too many random transient peaks because I want to get the most, I want the most visual to happen, right? Also, having said that, the more dynamic it is, it does kind of look a bit more um, organic. So maybe don't compress the heck out of it to where it's just a brick of audio. I'll leave that up to you. But the same applies here. If I were to go File, Save, okay, and save this out, when I go back to After Effects, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna modify this, it updates inside your timeline. So the process works the same way, really nicely, really easily, okay? And now I'm kind of liking that, that multicolor waveform. <laughs> we used to do when we used to show. Um, no, I'm not going to save changes. When we used to show uh, some of our preset text styles and the old titler in Premiere, there were a lot that looked like this. Everything was with a fill and a stroke, and they all had like very colorful '80s looking gradients. <laughs> Not my not my best design work. This one this one definitely looks a lot cleaner. I uh, I prefer this nicer overall. Okay, so that's four things. All right. Last thing I'm going to show you here in Audition. Oh, I just closed Audition. Duh. Why did I do that? Um, is just one more element. In fact, here we can even do it by launching this again. Let's let's go ahead and go back to this. All right. Let's launch Audition. Oh, see, that opened. I didn't want that. That opened QuickTime has somehow taken over Edit Original for. Oh, because it's a dot movie file. Nah. Of course, that'll be associated with QuickTime, not Audition here. Um, is the Diagnostics panel. And this is one where, again, quick tip for anybody if you've got random clicks that you need to get rid of, if you've got digitally clipped sections, this can work wonders. So you can quickly scan. Now, in this case, it didn't find any particularly clip sections. We can actually see that visually anyway. Sometimes you may clip the preamp in a way that, in fact, causes clipped samples or what used to refer to as overs. However, it's still at zero dB. In this case, you can see that while I do have a single peak, my hand clap here for my clapboard, it did hit zero dB. 
but there actually weren't any clipped samples, right? And the other highest peak, which you can jet to right here by clicking on that, um, right here is minus 0.28, all right? So you can see it right there, all right? If we ch chose this one, obviously it was this clap right there. So by the way, if you're ever wondering what these things do, click on those, it's gonna take you to the, the absolute sample where that occurred, all right? Like where your average amplitudes are and all of this kind of stuff and your lowest amplitude, all right? Very cool, and your peaks, all right? So you have declipper, declicker, couple of presets in here, heavy reduction, light reduction, medium reduction, all right? For the declipper, I usually tell people to start with restore normal. Now what that will often do is it will using, because um, Audition is working in 32-bit float, it'll clean things up and make it nice, nice and easy, um, but it won't change the overall amplitude, all right? But that's all the time we have, friends. Unfortunately, God, it goes so quickly. Stay tuned, we've got Paul coming up next. Have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world, and we'll see you again next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.